What is up, Substance? Make some noise wherever you are at. Let's welcome everybody joining us wherever you are. You made it to church, and I'm so glad. I'm Pastor Peter Haas, and today, you guys, I'm telling you, you are in for a huge, huge treat because we flew in someone all the way from New Zealand, and if you don't know where New Zealand is, it's the other side of the world. Let's just say totally different time zone, but we are honored with somebody by the name of Cy Rogers, and if you don't know Cy Rogers, I'll tell you what, he has the most incredible story. If I could have Cy come on up here right now. Now, we've had Cy Rogers in before, but his, just I'll tell you what, just every single time I hear Cy speak, it just, it, it profoundly changes me. And so, of course, um, you know, Cy, seriously, your story is, is so profoundly impacting, and he's going to be sharing his story with you today, as well as just some powerful biblical truths that I really believe are just going to take you and, and bring you closer to God. And, and seriously, every time you speak, I'm like, I'm like feverishly writing notes. And, and I, I just, the, the, you know how you hang out with some people and you can just feel more peace, feel more joy in your life? That's what I believe you're going to experience through the ministry of Cy Rogers today. And again, would you guys, one more time, just stand up and give Cy a warm substance. Welcome as he comes to bring the heat. Thank you. All right. Please be seated. Thank you. I always say, I hope you'll feel like that when I'm done. It is great to be back in the Twin Cities. I won't mention that I was in Florida yesterday, but still, I'm delighted to be here to serve you. I've had a long relationship, actually, with Substance Church, but who's meeting me for the first time? Where have you been? Well, I'm delighted that you're here. The family of faith is growing. This house is on fire, and it's awesome to get to be a contributing voice. And I hope that what I offer today will further encourage you in your journey with God and then through you in making impact in your age and world. You know, if you're meeting me for the first time, I've been in ministry now for 39 years, which means I'm about 200. And uh, I specialize in addressing sexual and relationship issues. Yay! <laughs> It's been anything but boring, but you know, in a work that takes me literally around the world, where I've been living overseas as a teaching pastor with the Hillsong Family Church in Auckland, New Zealand, and also having lived in Asia, in Singapore, and traveling sometimes up to 200,000 miles a year, it's all a great big laboratory of learning, because I have this front row seat to see what God is doing among his people around the world and over a period of years. And one of the things he is not letting us off the hook about is addressing issues of sexuality. But I want to make some clarifying statements here. I have not come to town to give you a moral lecture about how you should live. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I want to share what God has done in my journey to encourage you in yours. Because I always say our histories may be different, but our humanity is the same. So while I've learned a lot as a caregiver, understanding the human drama, and even better about God's character, I have to practice what I preach and teach. I have to apply it in my own life. So in walking with God for 40 years does not mean I think I have arrived and know it all, but I've learned some very important lessons because for me, the miracle is not that God reached down and rescued me from a particular ditch. It's that I walked on with God for 40 years in spite of my vulnerability here and the risks and pressures out there. There are reasons why I did not give up, give in, and go back. When many begin the journey, they don't sustain. So I want to empower you. Not that you need it, but I mean, we all have a friend, so listen for them. And, and I also like to make a point, you know, people struggle sexually and they wonder why. What's wrong with me and why isn't this resolving and I'm begging God to take it away. And I have to remind people, God takes away your guilt, not your human vulnerability. But he gives us solutions to address those concerns. And so tonight we'll have a longer play opportunity to understand why are we vulnerable and even better, what we can do about it. Because God doesn't point stuff out in our lives to shock us and shame us. He only reveals so that he can deal in a redemptive way. He is the God of sexual redemption. But many people growing up in religious culture don't know that. They think that they are bad, God is mad, and they run from God. And that's not productive. I want to change the flavor of thinking if you have been misthinking about God, that if you struggle, who said you wouldn't? 
And that you're not bad, you're just human and vulnerable. And God is not mad, he's the great big redemptive advocate of our humanity who has shared our humanity and his word tells me that when I am struggling, I can approach his throne of grace and expect to find an approachable God who is empathetic to my plight, who has shared every temptation we know, and then who says, I can find grace and mercy to help me in my time of need. So any other voice, do not let it chase you away from God. Run to him, not from him. That's what I've learned. So I want to encourage you. And I have to say, it is a better day, especially with your generation. You're not afraid to address these concerns. Because I would say that in my generation, we didn't want to talk about these things, but that did not make us holier, it did not make us healthier, and it didn't help us help people. So when I'm talking to you here, I am not talking to criticize or lament or judge or reject. We are here to paint a picture of a redemptive God, take it out into a broken, needy world, and then make disciples of God's sons and daughters. So whatever your history, whatever your struggles, you can be confident in his love and grow forward into his purpose. Would you agree? So I want to be clear on that because people think, oh, he's going to talk about sex. It's yet another moral lecture. No, it won't be. I want to share what's worked for me. Now, you know, before I jump into all of that, uh, I'd just like to point again to the idea we serve a God who redeems our sexuality. This is not new conversation to God. It's your turn to perhaps hear it. But you distill it from the Bible. We look at Rahab and Samson, King David and Mary Magdalene, the adulteress, the woman at the well, and the New Testament church. I rattled off in 20 seconds seven illustrations over 3,000 years of the God who redeems everything we give him, including our sexuality, including mistakes that we make. His love and redemption are bigger than our ability to fail. Would you agree? So our confidence is in his character. So this is nothing new to God. He redeems everything we give him. But before I jump into the word, I do want to introduce my wife of 37 years. Miss Karen is here. Good morning, sweetie. In fact, if you would, team, put up the slide and I'll introduce you to my family. Being married 37 years will teach you something, particularly my wife is one of seven children. I married a village of 52 immediate in-laws. It was my big, fat Irish Catholic wedding. And... Uh, they love the Lord, and they love me, and I've been blessed, and I also love being a daddy, and I love being a granddaddy. I don't know how it happened. I'm only 38, but there they are, and I love, I love my grandchildren. They all live down under. There they are at a beach we enjoy often in New Zealand, and uh, if you have a chance to come down under, we have three church campuses in beautiful Auckland and then a church campus in Melbourne, Australia, so uh, the name of the church is called Life, and we hope that if you have a chance to come to town, you'll look it up. It would be a delight to serve you there. But back to my family, you know, I, I put this image up to make a point. This is not the goal for a person's life. Marriage does not complete you. God does. Marriage is a partnership of risk, responsibility, and reward. It is not a cure. And therefore, I did not move forward in life toward this goal as my goal. God is my goal. So whether you are single or whether you are married, it is not another person who completes you. No one really can except the source, which is God. But this is the outworking of growth in my life and of God addressing interferences that had hijacked my life. More about that in a moment. But these images also make some important points for you. Uh, these images I'm not pointing them out to you to try to prove I'm not who I used to be because anybody can live a double life and sometimes Christian people do. But these images represent a very important point that it really matters who you're listening to. Because if I had continued listening to my all-knowing peer group, if I had continued listening to my pop culture and media, if I had continued listening to the voices of academia, I would not be here talking to you. If I had continued listening to the voices of the bullies, if I continued listening to the voices of my own self-doubt, I would not be on this platform talking to you, and these people would not exist in real life. Therefore, it profoundly matters who you're listening to. So in a media civilization of many opinions, some are forced upon us, many opinions are there to consider, many opinions we align with to bolster our worldview. At the end of the day, above all the fray of those opinions, there is one opinion that matters more. So whatever you think of me really doesn't matter at the end of the day, but what you think about God and his opinion does. So if you remember nothing else I say, seek that opinion. There are many opinions we can surround ourselves with, but at the end of the day, there's the one opinion that matters most. 
Seek it. They exist because of whom I chose to listen to. And then I look at that image of my grandson. He was six in that photograph. And when I was six, my life was very different. Can I tell you how grateful to God I am that my grandson has not had to walk through the litany of things that I did by the time I was six? I can't change my history, but I'm so glad I get to make new history. God gives us all that opportunity. So by the time I was six, I'd already been sexually violated by an adult man, a, a family friend who had access to me and who betrayed my dad's trust, and I learned things I was not supposed to know. Then my mother is killed in a car accident, and then I'm separated from my father, all of it by the time I'm six. I tried to be one of the guys, and I tried to conform to the norm. People expected it where I grew up in the buckle of the Bible Belt in the United States. And so I tried to be one of the boys, and I was on swim team and football team and track team. I was an Eagle Scout. I went hiking in the Rocky Mountains. I had two motorcycles. I went dirt bike riding. I could do anything any boy could do, but it didn't heal the deep woundedness of my soul, not only through abuse, but growing up, beginning at about the age of six, to be labeled, and then further rejected, and then further exploited. And I grew up that by the time I was a teenager, I had already learned to trade sex for validation. A lot of people do that, because even bad love is better than no love at all, says Proverbs 27, verse 7. Pardon my paraphrase. C.S. Lewis, the author philosopher, says, your human appetite will not tolerate to be ignored. You'll satisfy it rightly or wrongly. It won't go away. And it's not just that we have a hunger for food, but our souls hunger for love. And if I don't get the good stuff, I won't settle for no stuff. And so even bad stuff is better than none at all. I love that about God who looks beyond what we do to see why. Thus, he is compassionate in, even in the face of misadventure. So I was hungry for love. In Psalm 107, God says, you know, I don't, I don't take away what you crave, but I will satisfy it rightly. The Lord Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman, the sexual sinner living with her sixth partner. He's speaking to her, and she engages him. Initially, she bristles, you, a Jewish man, talking to me. And then she could see he wasn't trying to solicit her. He meant her no harm. And they engage in conversation, and... She says, wow, I can see that you are a prophet from your people, and I know that one day from your people a Messiah will come, and he'll show us how to be friends again with God. And Jesus said more plainly to a sexually sinful woman, he said to her more plainly than to his own people, I who am talking to you am that Messiah. And I think it's God's way of reminding us that everybody matters where they are, like they are, and it's one thing to know about a Jesus, it's another thing to personally encounter him. And he goes on to read her mail, and he says, you've come here to this well to put water in the jug, and that jug of water will not quench your deepest thirst, inferring neither will your sixth partner right now. But I know you're thirsty, and I'm not here to fault your craving. I have living water to satisfy you. If you knew it, your deep need would be served. I've got the bread of life. I've got the living water. Feed off of me. The inference is, if I'm not feeding off of God as my source, I will practice the idolatry of looking to one other human to be all that I need. And no one can do that but God. So God doesn't criticize craving. He satisfies it. So I was far from God doing the best I knew to find my validation, trading sex for value. And I believed in the God of the Bible, maker of heaven and earth, I went to youth group and church, and I believed in Jesus, the Messiah, but I believed God hated people like me. I wonder where I picked that up, and I did not view him as a resource. I viewed him as a judge. Though I believed he was real, I could not really yield to his character because I could not reconcile how did this good God I learned about in Sunday school, personal, powerful, and loving, allow this dreadful litany of events to unfold in my life, and then he blames me because I'm off track. So while I believed he existed, I did not believe he was good. And yet into this fray, when even some Christians would say, you are reprobate and don't deserve salvation, God rocked up 40 years ago and opened my eyes to him in an altogether new way. I say to people, why am I not a Buddhist? And why am I not a Marxist? And why would I bother crucifying my flesh 
and swimming against the tide of my popular culture telling me I'm misguided. Why? For services? No. For singing songs? No. For religious activity? I could have cared less. I had an encounter with God who ceased to be an idea to debate with the chattering classes over coffee at uni. He was no longer some philosophical point of view or a religious option on the spiritual buffet. He became a real life presence. And though I could not touch him tangibly, I could not deny his tangible impact. And in that encounter, he did not say to me, you stop living like this. He said, my son, stop resisting me. Walk with me. Learn about me. Think of those words. My, I want you. I'll put my name on you. I'm not ashamed to be identified with you. I, I want you. My son. That is whatever caused you to question your gender, whatever made you feel inadequate and inferior, whatever drove you into looking for validation through these other ways, I understand you and I never intended these things to be a burden. And therefore, my son, I will align you with my intention if you will walk with me. So I began a journey with God, and I wish I could say he just waved the magic wand over my life and turned me into the Vin Diesel lookalike that you see before you today. But what he did begin to do was he began to bring cleansing to defilements. He began to bring healing to my angry, wounded, ripped off heart. And then he dressed himself up in skin and loved me so potently through his people that I did not have to go back to old bread. They gave me something better. Because it isn't religious activity that makes you feel loved. It's not singing songs or hearing sermons. Those things aren't bad. It's not a code of ethics that could be wise to keep you on a healthier path. But the only thing that really makes you feel loved is healthy relationship investments over time that convince you you've got value. And that's what my church did for me. And that's what I want to talk about today because in my years of working with people who have struggled in all manner of sexual ways all over the world in different cultures and denominations, they have one thing in common, the number one reason for their struggle. It isn't porn. It isn't because they have hormones. The number one reason for their struggle is they are hungry to be validated. They are hungry to be loved. And so while sex isn't the vehicle to get love, it's only when you really know what healthy love is that sex can take on a healthier expression. If you've never known healthy love, then bad love is better than none. And I want to share what my church did right to take me forward. Would you like to hear that? I'm going to tell you anyway. I thought you'd like to feel participatory. <laughs> and why this message matters is because we are living in an age where our church culture is bashed as being bigoted and unloving. And whatever our imperfections as the church, this is still the vehicle through which God mediates himself to our culture, makes himself known, and also makes sons and daughters. And my church, if you would have interviewed them 40 years ago, would have felt quite inadequate to know what to do. You think I'm a strong cup of coffee today? You should have been in their skin 40 years ago before we had our cultural sensitivity as we do today. And they wouldn't have known what to do, but they did three things so well, I'm here talking to you 40 years later. It's worth clarifying, would you agree? But before I go there, this commercial announcement, if you would please. I do have a website, cyrogers.com. We have a variety of downloadable material for you long after today. How to retrain that brain and break the power of past patterns, we'll talk about it tonight. And then also a four-hour man talk conference filmed before a live audience speaking to men about redeemed manhood and how to become responsible stewards of mind and body. I love it that we may not be able to change the past, but we can make new history and go forward. And therefore, insights there to serve you long after today. Also, I have some deliberate posting on Instagram also to serve you with deliberate posts that don't just tell you I'm having coffee now, but rather are designed to serve you long after our time is done today. All of that there to serve you. Thanks for shopping Simart. Now shall we pray and get underway. Lord, take these words as always. Anoint them with life and power to make it more than infotainment that we discard. Make it rather a revelation that will draw us near you and also Make your kingdom richer in and through us. We believe you would love to do that. So we agree in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I jump into those three points, I, I have to preface this conversation by redefining the word love. My church loved me. But what does love mean? I needed clarity because I grew up as a product of popular culture at the peak of the sexual revolution. And therefore, I thought love meant sex. 
I thought love meant some kind of warm, fuzzy sentiment or some kind of passion. And you would agree that love may include those elements, but it's not limited to nor defined by those elements. And now the reason mattered because, you see, I now belong not to pagan culture anymore. I didn't belong to pop culture anymore. I belonged to God culture. And since God is love... I needed the newer definition, the newer understanding. I believe that pop culture rightly points out that we hunger for love, but it did not invent it. God did, and he is love. And I'm to love him above everything else, and I'm to love my neighbor as myself. I'm even to love my enemy. In fact, Jesus prayed the world would know your mind, not by your religious activity, but by the way that you love, and therefore that's the distinctive. So I needed to be clear on the God definition. So I have redefined the word love since it has spread so thin on the toast of our lives in an age of marketing and hype. Here's how I've redefined the word love from a biblical idea, and you don't have to agree with me, but I have the mic. You'll have to do your own message. But to me, the word love simply means this, to value. For God so valued the world that he didn't feel it with sentiment or talk. He took heroic Action to rescue us, for God so valued the world. Greater value of another has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Value God above everything else. Other things may be valuable to you, but God should be the most valuable, and the way that you live will prove what's valuable to you. If you value me, do what I ask. Thus, I must find out what he asks. Value your neighbor. Assign value to others in the way that you hope others value you. Value your enemy. You don't have to like them, trust them, understand them, or approve of what they do to yet assign value to them. We learn to value other people when we first get convinced we've got value. And I had only one sense of value and that was to be sexually available and exploitable. And now that I had walked away from that bread, what better bread did my church give me? Because you'll often hear people say, in my gay bar, in my straight bar, in my AA meeting, I can sometimes find more love, more connection, more community, more camaraderie than I do in church. And that might be right. But I want to tell you what, my church valued me in such a potent way that all the other options lost their power. I got something better. You need it and you can give it because everybody hungers for it. So now that we're clear, God began to insist I go to church. It was scary for me. I had unplugged from one way of life. I had not yet plugged into the family of faith. I was in that wilderness. Like the Hebrew children, they left Egypt. They weren't at the promised land. But out there in that wilderness, they were forced to find God is source. But God led me to church. He knew I needed it. And I was scared. And I thought, you know, God... Church represents judgment to me. It, it represents standards I'm always reminded of that I fail. I don't know if I want to do that. And God yet insisted, so I went to church and others would go out for fellowship. And I would go home alone and feel sorry for myself. Gee, God, your people aren't being very nice. And sometimes God will comfort you and sometimes God will challenge you. And this time it was that. And he, in so many words, spoke this idea to me. Son, you expect other people to understand. Well, you've got to understand that they don't. So you're just going to have to live your life in front of them. And as they observe you, then they will see that my work in you is genuine and your commitment to me is sincere. Then trust will be earned. Then hearts will open. Then you'll connect and then you'll grow forward. But until that day happens for you, who will you follow? Who will you serve? Or are you running back to your old life because this is difficult for you right now? So off to church I went, and what God said came true in time. People embraced me and valued me well, but in three specific ways that you and I need and that others do too. So if you put the notes up, you can follow along with me. We'll just teach you. So over here on the right, when we hear that God is love, it's not an airy-fairy Hallmark greeting card concept, but rather it is a concrete, pragmatic reality of his character demonstrated in these specific ways. So here's how my church valued me. First, through acceptance, which may not seem like a great revelation, but I promise you it is because everybody in this room is afraid of rejection. You were never designed for it psychologically. It is one of the greatest wounds you will know to be neglected or rejected. Acceptance is a relationship language, and it says this. You are so valuable to me. 
I'll take you like you are. I'd really rather have you messy than not have you at all. Isn't that what everybody wants? Everybody. But people are scared to death that the light will shine in some dark corner and the truth might be revealed about us. So we wear protective masks, and that is not a criticism. In fact, it may be an actually smart discernment because maybe others are not prepared for the revelation about your dark corner. So if you're wearing a mask, I'm not suggesting you take it off. Of course, I've never had much advantage of mask wearing. People have never looked at me and said, gee, I wonder what Cy struggled with before he met Jesus. Addiction to sport, perhaps. And, and so <laughs> you, you think that works against me, but it actually doesn't. Because you see, I've learned this. For me, the haunting question has been answered. If people knew the truth about me, would they still value me? So everybody may not love me, everybody may not trust me, and everybody may not want to be my friend, but the people who do love and trust me and who are my friends, they know the worst dirt about me, and the haunting question is answered, and the question is this, if my dirt were, be, if my dirt were to be revealed, would I still be valuable in their eyes? And I have been convinced, and therefore those whose acceptance is informed about me, it's worth its weight in gold. And here's the truth for you. Even if you wisely wear your mask, because, you know, before I ever went public, I edited my story. There's a lot of detail I don't go into because it's not about my gory story. It's about the glorious character of God in the middle of my humanity. So there's a lot I don't need to talk about. And before I went public, I had permission from my wife, from my in-laws, from my dad and stepmother, and I had permission from my pastor and my elders because once you tell it, you can't take it back. And my life went viral to five continents in 1984. And so living a public life is the platform God has asked me to live. But we are all living letters to some degree. And so maybe you wisely wear that mask right now because God has not asked you to take it off. But the cruel truth is, Jesus knows all your dirt and he adopted you anyway. He knows all your regrettable deeds. He knows all the dark corners and he adopted you anyway. His acceptance of you is not only fully informed, he covers you with Christ that you can rest in the knowledge and be at peace in your soul that when I'm working on my stuff, I'm not earning his love. He's already given it to me. He values me so much. He covers me in Christ so that I can rest in the knowledge. I'm accepted. I have a place at the table. I belong to the family. And when I'm working on my stuff, it's not earning his acceptance. He's already given it to me. And from that platform of strength, I can grow up as a son or a daughter in God. My church accepted me in a profound way, especially the men in my church. You know, my problem was not with the opposite sex. I understood masculine attraction to the feminine. But before boys grow up into men who like women, they have to bond with the same sex to properly form identity. And when that doesn't happen, deep insecurity can result. It affects the way people feel about themselves and how they love and relate, even with regard to sexuality. And so for me, I had been robbed of that growing up, robbed of a father, robbed of the bond of brothers. I had been robbed of a good self-concept. But now in God, you get a new father in a new family with a new band of brothers who compensate in a new opportunity. And the men in my church were like God with skin on. Those men were so unafraid of me. The man who became the best man at my wedding said a profound thing to my face when he said, you know, Cy, I've not struggled exactly in the ways that you have, but I've struggled sexually and I've struggled with lust and insecurity and set back. And if God can help me with my stuff, he can help you with your stuff because your problems aren't sexual. They're just human. And there's where an everyday guy without a degree in psychology gave me a revelation. He was unashamed to be seen with me across the table from me in a restaurant, knowing he would be judged by virtue of association, and his ego was secure enough to take it for my benefit. He assigned value to me. The men in my church who loved me, held me, hugged me, touched me, took me to the men's camp and the men's retreat, the men's Bible study and the men's breakfast, those men convinced me against my previous convincing that I had value to them and it did not include exploitation. It changed my life. That's acceptance. The warm embrace that says, you're so valuable to me, I'll take you like you are. I'd really rather have you messy than not at all. So rest. There may be things to work on, but it's okay. We're not earning acceptance. We're just growing up as sons and daughters. And so there we see a God on the right-hand side who is completely aware of all your dirt and he's understanding of why it's there. Therefore, he can look upon us with compassion 
and not only offer us mercy, but he, he's the God that I can approach and that he will not shame me. I just posted it on Instagram. God has never held my history over my head. He has never shamed me. He has never held it against me. He has only ever called me son and only ever assured me of my value before him. How else do you think I can live a public life in the scrutiny that I have to walk through? So have you not yet been convinced that you're accepted? Don't listen to any other voice but his opinion. Second thing that's proof of value that my church offered me, like God with skin on, is they held me accountable. Now that's not a very popular word in the age of the millennial tolerance of all things. It's our highest civic virtue, our highest secular value, to be tolerant, as long as you agree with the party line, of course. But that said, accountability is proof of value, proof of love. Because if acceptance is the warm embrace that says, you're so valuable to me, I'll take it like you are. Accountability says, but I'm not going to leave you where I find you because you're valuable. Accountability is proof of love. Accountability says you are valuable. It says, if I find you in some ditch of dysfunction, how can I claim that you're valuable to me if I leave you in the ditch? Jesus, the good shepherd, is not static. He may find us in a particular place and absolutely love us there, but he won't leave us there. His love for us, his value of our lives and our future and the influence we carry over others, he will groom us, he will grow us, he will guide us into his intention because shepherds lead the sheep to the good stuff. Shepherds guide the sheep on the healthy path of wisdom. Shepherds have an intention and a destination. So wherever you engage God, whatever on-ramp you take toward God, he will not leave you where he finds you. He will take you further. And if nobody told you before, you need to know that's the deal. That's the bargain with God. He'll take you like he finds you, but he won't leave you there. Because he values you and your life, your future. He made you on purpose for purpose, and he's going to get you to it. So accountability can mean many things. It's kind of a multifaceted concept. So, you know, I think of, of accountability like a, 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 a tree, a, a sapling planted into very soggy soil of spring. Well, right now the roots don't go deep enough to anchor it. And even the, the March winds that breeze through could blow it over. So what do we do? We don't criticize the tree for being not mature yet. Instead, we brace it so that it will be able to stand the pressure of the wind and that its roots will inevitably, as it grows, go down into the earth and anchor it. Yes? In fact, they've discovered that most forests exist not because the roots go deep, but because the roots connect with the roots of other trees, and together they are able to stand in the strong wind. Accountability is kind of like this. I have to answer the boss for so, how I spend the money. So let's just say that I'm the financial controller of a particular corporation. I have access to the money and access to the books, but I'm going through a financially hard time in my personal life, and so I have access to all these resources, and so I am tempted by some voice, probably not the Holy Spirit's, to take some of that money. Oh, I'll pay it back, but I'm tempted to access the money and take it and apply it to my financial crisis. But because I know that cameras are watching me and watching the books and that the boss will give an, uh, require an account for the money, I extinguish the temptation. Though I wish my heart is always noble and that I could never be tempted, it's nice that accountability reminds me my interior world may even deceive me, but there is still an anchoring in accountability that keeps me safe in swirling currents within and around me. Accountability is kind of like this. Let's say that I see you playing on Interstate 35 in rush hour traffic blindfolded. I, I come upon this situation. I'm on a service road driving next to the freeway and I see you out there on the motorway How, and I'm, I'm shocked that you're undertaking such risk. So I park the car, I get out and I yell across the, the grass at you, hey, what are you doing on the freeway playing dodge car blindfolded? Look, I'm sure it's thrilling, Wee, but I am worried about your welfare. Won't you please reconsider and come off the road? What you're doing is dangerous. And then you say, how dare you judge me? Oh no, dear, I'm not judging you. 
I'm judging your behavior. Your behavior's dangerous. You're putting others at risk as well as yourself, and I care enough to dare enough to call you out. Because if I were to just walk away and so say, oh, well, you know, good luck with that to each his own. Hope you live. Have a nice day. I'm nobody's judge. Then actually, that's not called valuing you. It's called contempt. It says, I really can't be bothered. You don't have enough value. See, we're confused in our generation about what judgment I'm allowed and what judgment I'm not. To be sure, Jesus warns us about judging. In fact, we remember the conversation where Jesus talking to his disciples says, you even say to your brother, Raka, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Now, some modern English translations of that Aramaic term, Raka, have turned that term into a word like stupid or idiot in a modern paraphrase. And if we are in danger of the fires of hell calling people stupid and idiot, we're in danger every day on the freeway. <laughs> I'm so glad you could relate. But this said, Raka does not mean stupid or idiot. Raka means worthless. And I am never allowed to declare somebody is worthless. Because whether I like it or not, God saves pedophiles and serial killers in prison. He saves Nazi war criminals, whether I think they deserve it or not. Because I'm not the ambassador of my opinion about the value of other people. I'm the ambassador of God's opinion about the value of people. And even if the image of God has been marred in somebody's life, they are still made in the image of God. Christ has died for them as much as you or I, and they still have value. That's right. Two people liked it. I appreciate it. Therefore, I feel validated. Anyway, so I'm not allowed to judge anybody's worth. Everybody's valuable. But I am allowed to judge truth from lie, beneficial from detrimental, wisdom from folly, healthy from unhealthy. I have to make those determinations, those assessments, those evaluations, and those judgments every day to survive in a world of risk. And so this idea that we don't judge is not true. When you read an online report about a restaurant, that the service was poor, they got a bad review, or worse, they had a bad hygiene report, and you decide, I'm not eating there for my health and welfare, you have made a judgment based on the information, yes? We just want to make sure the information is accurate with regard to judgment. So I, I must learn to discern and make these judgments in life. For example, training my daughter. I'll never forget when she was 15, I had to help her find some discernment. She came to me. I was in the kitchen doing something, and in a state of distraction, she made her move when she just wanted to slip it under the door, just under my radar where I didn't quite tune in, and she said, Hey, Daddy, can I go to that party on Friday? But I heard her. I said, What party? And she said, Well, Dad, it's a very important party, and I want to go on Friday. Can I go? And I said, I, and then she knew where this was going, so she brought out the heavy artillery. Dad, my entire psychological well-being and social standing depends that I'm at this party on Friday. And I said, wait just a minute. I went to that party when I was 15. I have fewer brain cells today because I went to the party. <laughs> and I know that 10 minutes after that party is over, nobody's going to even know, know or care that you were ever there. They didn't bring you into this world through blood, sweat, and tears. They're not on their knees every day crying out to God that you will survive yourself in this season of your life to go fulfill your destiny. They don't hemorrhage blood money to try to keep your lifestyle afloat like I do. I could give you what you want and give in and avoid a conflict and be your friend in the moment, but I am more than just your friend. I am your father. <laughs> Therefore, the answer is no. She stomped off. Fifteen years later, she has her own two children. And in a moment of clarity and revelation, she came to me and she said, Daddy, you were so right about that party. And I went, ching, bliss. And that's when, that's when God says, welcome to my world. Because God says, those whom I value, I train them. I correct them. I discipline them. That's why you're called disciples, the ones being disciplined off the pagan path of the world around you and onto the God path of wisdom for your welfare. Yeah. 
And at the time, the Bible says, you're not going to like it. You're not going to appreciate it. You're not going to always understand it. When I say no here, to say yes later, to disappoint you and make it an appointment later. But one day you'll come to your senses with a new perspective and you will say, thank you, God. You valued me enough to train me, groom me, guide me, grow me, and corral me and help me to not give in to my own devices and my old ways and the old patterns when triggered. Instead, you help me grow beyond that, that I can be a healthier, more responsible person so I don't hurt me and I don't hurt you. Thank you that you value me. The disciples are talking to Jesus and they're asking him, so what's it going to be like when you come back? What's the heads up? Jesus said, I'll tell you. Here's your heads up. And he goes through the famous end time signs like in Matthew chapter 24. And what we tend to do in the modern church is obsess about the end time signs, like how many toes the Antichrist has, oh my, and you know, I'm on board, I'm into all of it with morbid fascination, blood moon, all of it. But it's really not about the rise of the Antichrist, it's about the return of the Christ. And he says, when I come back, you're going to answer to me for how you spent the money. That's not an oppressive threat, that is a clarified understanding that I'm watching you. And one day, I'm going to stand in front of him. And I want to hear him say, well done, Cy. Oh, you were a messy brat, but we corrected that. Because even though you fell down, you got up. Even though you got dirty, you washed off. You did not give up. You kept getting up. And though other voices called your name, you heard me call your name, and you kept walking toward me. And though other things wanted you to bow and give allegiance to those things, you bowed and gave allegiance to me. And I look back over your weak, imperfect life, and I see instead of seducing people and manipulating people and ripping people off, you used your weak, imperfect life to bring blessing and encouragement to people the best you knew how, and so I look back over that life and I see much less regret and a future of reward. It was worth it all, proof of value. And so my church held me accountable in a couple of practical ways like this. Part one, I suppose, is I belong to the men's group, and I remember the men's breakfast once a month, we would usually do a little check-in. How are we going? Celebrating victories and bringing our weaknesses for prayer so that we wouldn't have to deal with this on our own. You know, people of, of a shared weakness, but a shared goal, sharing the journey together. Which is why a therapist friend of mine said we should really just call Christianity Sinners Anonymous. We need these weekly meetings. You know, we're all getting over things, and we need these meetings to stay on the wagon. And I think there's truth in that. So the director of the men's breakfast said to me one day, Sasai, how are you dealing with your dirty thoughts this week? I said, same as you. And I said, oh, okay, okay. I was watching the television, the television the other day, and I saw these things, and I can't get them out of my head. They're so sticky and, and pleasure igniting, and, and, and I, I'm having a hard time putting that down. And, and, and so, you know, can I borrow some of your authority, and we bring this into the light, and we pray over it like pouring bleach on the fungus that we kill its power? It may be embarrassing for me to admit, but it's so much better than keeping the secret with Satan in the dark. When it comes to sin, you pay now or you pay later. You pay more when you pay later in the age of credit. How many pastors have I talked with who have had moral failure who will say they wish to God they had opened up and taken the risk earlier to admit and submit to counsel and support rather than keeping the secret? It doesn't make them bad. It just makes them vulnerable. So having said it, that's a type of accountability. But also my church held me accountable to this idea. I only saw myself as damaged goods, damaged merchandise, and my great ambition was just to hang on to Jesus till I died. The fact that, well, that he had condescended to rescue me blew my mind, and I had no imagination of marriage and ministry and a life beyond all of this. I felt so defined by my humanity and history. But my church, they saw more than damaged goods. They saw gifting, anointing, and calling. And they held me accountable to a very important idea that you are more than damaged goods. You are made on purpose for God's purposes. And those things do not limit nor define you. Don't let them. You are limited only 
by the submission or lack of it to God. And therefore, we aim you toward that mark. And they didn't just pat me on the head and say, have a Jesus-filled day. They paid for my ministry salary as an intern. They paid for my theological training. And they paid for my involvement in the men's conference and the men's retreat. And I'm here talking to you today because they held me accountable to the idea that I made on purpose for God's purposes in spite of my history and my humanity. Amen? So are you. And there's the God who holds us accountable. That means he's an observer. We matter, and he observes, and, and he guides us, therefore, on the good path to the good stuff. And along the way, where there was weakness and vulnerability or misinformation or interference, he trains, he corrects, he guides, he grooms us, he helps us, and then he rewards us for staying loyal to him instead of the many other voices that call our name. He calls our name and rewards our endeavor. And then finally here, affirmation is proof of value. Affirmation is an interesting English word that in so many words, like First John says, I'm not just going to tell you that I love you, talk is cheap. If you are really valuable to me, I'm going to prove it to you. So, like Romans says, we rejoice with those who rejoice. Why? We are celebrating the character of God. So if you've had a breakthrough, you've had an intervention, you've had a, a revelation, you've had a victory, I can celebrate it. Even if it's not my turn yet, my turn will come. God values us all. So when I stand with you and rejoice and champion you, I am reminded that my turn will come too. We are celebrating God's good character. But also we grieve with those who grieve. Why would I bother grieving with a widow? Why would I grieve with the parents who lost a child? Because I am saying that your suffering matters because you matter to God and you matter to me. You know, when I was walking through the issue of my childhood sexual abuse in therapy, I'd now become, uh, you know, I'd become a Christian and I was now walking with the Lord for 10 years at this point. And, uh, I wasn't ready before to face those things and deal. But now, with maturity comes capacity, capability. And I was now mature enough to not only get the support of family and friends and colleagues, I sought out professional counsel. God never said I had to walk through a dark valley by myself. And, you know, he says as the good shepherd, he walks through the dark valley with me. But he does that also in skin. And he did that through the skin of not just friends and family, but also through therapists. And I had good talk time. It wasn't pleasant, but it was pain toward healing. And we talked about these things and brought them into the light. But one day my counselor said an amazing thing. He said, we've had good talk time, but rather than talking today, how about we just invite the Holy Spirit to weigh in? and let him share insight into all these things we've been discussing. And I said, that's a really good idea. I wouldn't have thought to do that, but let's invite him. And you, you, know, you kind of hope he'll turn up. <laughs> it's a very important moment for your own heart, so you hope God will be polite and validate you. And, and, and he did. He showed up in the form of a vision, God owning it. He showed up in the form of a vision, and in it he revealed himself to me like a father who learned of my abuse, and I watched him break and weep over what had happened to me. And over a, a billion things God might have said or, or done in that moment, why that? I'll tell you, no one had ever wept for me. No one had ever indicated to me that my suffering mattered, that I mattered. Even Christians would say well-intentioned things like, when are you going to let it go and buck up and move on and forgive and put it behind you? <sighs> made me mad. I knew my theology. I fully intended to forgive, and I wanted to put it behind me. But now that I was finally facing it, not running from it, I didn't want to just get over it like it didn't matter. Now that I saw how much it had affected me, I needed to know, did this matter to anybody? These events changed my life. And when you tell me just to get over it, it's like you're saying how this affected you doesn't matter. And in that vision, the Lord put his arms around me, and he wept over me and said, your daddy sees it. Your daddy's sorry. He did not give me amnesia and discard the memory of it as if it had no significance. He, instead, he entered into the pain and shared it with me to let me know that my pain mattered to him because I mattered to him. And that's the pivoting point my soul began to mend. And that's where God turned the wound that crippled my ability to love and trust. And he not only let me survive it, but then he brought healing and I began to thrive. And then he turned the wound into a wellspring for a global ministry that makes the devil pay for ever having conspired to rip me off. And that's how God redeems everything we give him. He affirms our value. He will do it for you.
Devil does not have the last word over your life. You know, I learned this lesson later with my daughter. She was learning to ride her bicycle. And as you do when you learn to ride a bike, you have your crash and burn learning curve. And so she did. Daddy, look at me, she said. Look at me ride, look at me ride. And I watched her, and I looked at her lose control of that bike, and I watched her cartwheel in slow motion across the asphalt. She got up, bleeding at every chin, joint, knee, and limb, and she began to scream at a frequency pitched so high only dogs could hear it. <laughs> and she came hobbling toward me, and I grabbed her up in my arms instinctively, just like God did me. And I said over her like God said to me, Oh, honey, Daddy knows it hurts. Let Daddy, let Daddy kiss it. Daddy's sorry. And she cried. <laughs> Not the nice, polite, church kind of crying, tissue-dabbing, mascara-saving, but this was the snot-producing, cathartic, trauma-processing crying. She cried for 20 minutes. <laughs> and finally, she began to ratchet down. <laughs> Bing, she was done. She slipped off my lap, and I said, Now, Gracie... You've had a rough go. Do you want to go in the house and get cleaned up, call it a day? Or do you want to get cleaned up and come back out and play a little longer? She thought about it, and then she began to walk to the door, and she said, I want to come back out and play some more, which meant her injuries were obviously not fatal, but they were painful, and her injuries would hurt her for several days. But when Gracie ran to me, she wasn't running to me to make pain stop. She was running for the more profound revelation. She did not know how to articulate it as a seven-year-old, but this is what her little heart wanted to know. Daddy, in a world of circumstances that hurt me and rip me off and make me feel devalued and powerless, when I can see that your heart is touched by my suffering, I can once again believe that I matter, that I have value in a world that often makes me doubt it. That's what everybody here wants to know. Don't just tell me that you love me. I've heard that before, but I'm willing that you would convince me that's why we go out into the world, isn't it? Try to stop sex trafficking because those precious children are not a commodity. That's why we want to help the addict because they are valuable and have a life of purpose, not being chained to an addiction. We want to go out and lift the hand of the single mom who's doing life tough because if that were my sister, I'd want somebody helping her too because she matters and so does that kid. And that's why Jesus said, the world will know your mind, not by your singing and your sermons and your moral lifestyles. Cults can offer that. The world will know your mind by the way you assign value. And that's what my church did for me. And that's why I'm here talking to you. And tonight I want to unpack it a lot further to tell you how God took my life forward in the hope that it will encourage you in your journey. Because again, our histories are different, but our humanity is the same. So as I wrap it up, you know, I want to share a little concluding story with you. It's brief and it's powerful. It's by Mary Ann Bird called The Whisper Test. You know, I've lived a public life since 1984, and part of that means you get, shall we say, feedback and critique. And that's the heat that comes with the public kitchen. I remember once a woman said to me, oh, well, surely God could do better than that. And so don't feel sorry for me. I live a public life on purpose. It's worth it. I've had to discover who I am and whose I am, however, because sometimes I look in the mirror and I can see why people still look at me as though I were deformed in their expectation. But here's what Mary Ann Bird taught me. She says, I grew up knowing I was different and I hated it. I was born with a cleft palate. And when I started school, my classmates made it clear to me how I looked to others. I was a little girl with a deformed nose and lopsided teeth garbled speech, and a deformed lip. When classmates would ask me, what happened to your lip? I would say that I had fallen and cut it on glass. Somehow it seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born so different. I was convinced that no one outside my family could value me. There was a teacher in school named Mrs. Leonard. Every year she gave us a hearing test. Everybody loved Mrs. Leonard. And I knew from past years that in taking the test, I would stand in the back of the room and cover one ear. The teacher sitting in the front of the room at her desk would whisper things, and I would have to repeat them to prove to her I could hear her. She would whisper simple things like, the sky is blue, or do you have new shoes? I waited there for those words that God must have put into her mouth, seven words that changed my life. Mrs. Leonard said in her whisper, I wish you were my little girl. 
God says to every person deformed by sin, I wish you were my son. I wish you were my daughter. And in Jesus, he makes it so. Let's pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the wonderful reminder of who you are, that you are invested in our lives because we matter to you. And for every man and woman in this room who needs their cup topped up, you are generous and do not resent our asking. You are generous to give us the bread of life and the living water. Beyond our salvation, you top up the cup of our need with the assurance of your love and that you who begin the good work do know how to bring us through, that we can find rest in your love and redemption. Come, Holy Spirit, not only to help us feed off this bread, but to take that bread out into the world around us for everybody needs to know your love and that they are valued by you. Come, Holy Spirit.